They look forward to the end of a shift. Unusual. The kind of day you don't want to see end. And yet, we all knew the mine would have to close someday. This business of a mine closing, it's something you live with all the time. Every day you blast another round, muck out another soap, you know the mine dies a little. She was a good mine. In 25 years, they tell me, we take out nine and a half million tons of muck out of it. Mostly copper, gold, silver, and some zinc. But there comes a point when it don't pay to take out any more. Grade is too low. It's just so much rock. there's only clean-up work to do around here. Of course, equipment that is still good will be sold to other mines. There's always a market for it. And some of it is good scrap. The rest will be left. But for the men on my shift, it's a little like breaking up a home and a family. Soon, this place will be like so many others that run out of ore and clothes. Good mines. They come, make employment for people, money for shareholders, good metal for industry. And then they die. Eh bien, after all this mining business, it's not like uh, l'agriculture. Once you take out the ore, it don't grow back like, uh, like potatoes in the field. are worth about two and a half billion dollars a year to this country, I'm told. That's the kind of a figure a salesman like myself understands. There's a lot of hard work goes into making any of the things we use in our day-to-day -day living. And it goes right back to the metal itself. It's got to have certain qualities built right into it to meet the specifications of Canadian customers who have all sorts of manufacturing problems. scientists to meet the challenge of today's needs and to satisfy the demands of the future. This research is vital if we are to maintain and improve our competitive position in world markets. And research will give us some important answers about the sophisticated alloys needed for the so-called space age. Canada is lucky, and a lot of people envious. But there's a price to be paid, too. Mining is a wasting thing. There's no point in coming out with that old platitude about our tremendous wealth in the Precambrian shield. 
It's only hypothetical until it's been discovered and proved by people willing to spend the money and take the long chance. Long chance? I'll say. It's the biggest game of blind man's bluff in the world and four million square miles of country to play it in. Used to be that prospectors like Bob and me depended on a grub hoe and a nose for ore. We worked alone, grub staked ourselves, and we'd find us a likely looking out crop of rock and cross our fingers. But times have sure changed. Nowadays, Bob and I work for a big company because it takes a lot of money to support a big party in the field. We're part of a team now, a team made up of prospector, geologist, geophysicist, and geochemist. Four out of five new mines are found by well-financed exploration companies using these new scientific techniques. Take geophysics, for example. With these doodads, uh, electromagnetic units they're called, a team can work over the ground pretty quickly. Hear that? He's picking up a signal sent out by his partner a couple of hundred feet away. If they get a kick, it means they've found something. An ore body, maybe. Some kind of conductor, definitely. And then there's geochemistry. We take silt samples from creeks and rivers. When they're analyzed, even the smallest traces of mineralization will show up. By following the stream back, we can pinpoint where the minerals first seeped into the water and get an idea of the land area they came from. If it really looks worthwhile, the company will send in a diamond drill and put down holes at regular intervals. These pieces of rock, called cores, help them build up a picture of what lies underground. Every ore body is different. Geological freaks of nature. The geologist sees all kinds. When you've found one, there's still the question of how do you mine it? Open pits. You strip off the overburden to get at the ore body. And then you drill and blast and load the broken ore into trucks to be taken to the mill for crushing and concentrating. Or maybe room and pillar. Let's say you have low-grade ore lying inside a mountain. Too low-grade to mine it in the ordinary way. So... You mine it in huge caverns, 200 feet long and as high as 100 feet. You have to leave pillars every so often to hold the back up. And to mine it at a profit, you have to forget all about conventional mining techniques and bring in big trucks and electric shovels and have custom-built mobile drills made. But wait a minute. Your problems are really only beginning. You have to find a way of separating the valuable mineral from the waste rock surrounding it. You see, nature doesn't put copper or zinc or gold in neat little packages. For instance, in a gold mine, you mine, crush and treat a ton of ore to get fractions of an ounce. on this kind of margin, that saying can be tricky. And it's got to be accurate. We're lucky that now, machines like this can tell us what our metal percentages are just by pushing a button. When you come to think that nature puts hundreds of different combinations in any one ore body, you begin to realize why they say that mineral dressing is an art. A lot of research goes into finding out how to float the mineral from the waste. Lab P-1 
people run hundreds of tests on ore samples before they finally arrive at the concentration process that really suits your particular ore body. Once the size of the ore body has been outlined, and the economics of mining and treating it have been plotted out in long-range terms, you're ready for the next step. That means drawing up engineering and feasibility reports for executive decision. Hmm. The reports look very promising. It'll mean a substantial investment, of course. About $10 million before we can go into production. Well, we're one of the lucky ones. When you consider the whole industry spends about $45 million a year on exploration. And it doesn't average much better than one and a half good, profitable mines for that amount of risk money. If we can get the directors to pass on this at the next meeting, we should have our crews out in the job by spring. doesn't stop with just a shaft in the mill. It's town building too, especially when you're 200 miles from the nearest settled community. By the time the mill turns over, there'll be about 2,000 people up there, men and their families. You get past the bunkhouse stage. We'll need sewer and water facilities and schools, of course. We'll have to build good, solid homes to attract workers and make them want to settle down. This new mine, a thousand tons a day, they tell me, and enough good ore underground for 15, 20 years. means lots more work for the men. And for some of my old shift, too. And before she closed, I'll bet they find another one. Yes, sir, I'll bet they find another good one. <laughs> 